morning, everybody. Welcome to church. Let's stand and sing. We've got a lot to be thankful for. Have you seen it? I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Faith Henderson. I am the Director of Missions here at uh, First Southern Baptist Church, and I'm the pastor of the staff, um, and everyone else here, if you're visiting, we are so thankful to have you this morning. Um, if you did not grab one when you came in, um, feel free to grab some. There are some still on the back table. Um, but in the worship guide, um, this has all the information that you need to know, at least for this week, um, about the life and different activities here at First Southern. Um, so please feel free to look through this. Um, and then if you are visiting, uh, under the seat in front of you is a connection card. Um, and we just ask that you please fill it out. Um, we would love to come alongside you and pray for you um, and get to know you a little bit better. And when you do fill it out, please bring it to the um, Welcome Center at the entrance of the church. And we would love to connect with you and um, see how we can be of service and support to you and your family. And we also have a gift for um, coming and treating us for the Sunday morning. And just really thankful to have you this morning. And we have a lot of exciting things planned for today and also for the month of October. So stay tuned. Thank you, Evan and Faith. Um, let's uh, real quick, just go ahead and everyone stand up. Let's greet each other this morning real quick.
Okay, you may be seated. Actually, I'll make you stand up again in just a second. Um, my name is Ricky Mays. Uh, I'm one of the deacons with Deacon Team 2, along with our crew over here. We've got Rick Roop, my dad, Rick Mays, and Phil Lewis. We're Deacon Team 2. Again, we're here um, as a deacon to serve the church. We want to find any way that we can serve you. And so if there's anything that you've got going on in your life, reach out to us. We can be there as, as the deacon body so we can lift up the church. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in the life of the church, as Faith mentioned. The one I'll mention, because it's next week, is the, uh, the, the church picnic. If you're planning on being there, great. Invite a friend to come. If you're not planning on being there, go ahead and add it to the calendar and show up anyway. Um, <laughs> and so we have a great time of fellowship. Um, lots of food. There's games. There's all sorts of stuff going on. Um, and and it, it's a great time of a fellowship with the church body, and so I, I recommend if you've not been before or you've been a thousand times, show up next Saturday. We'll have a great time with our our church picnic. Um, show up around eleven. I know some of the signs may not have the the exact time, and we'll start eating around noon. Um, so just to throw that one out there for you. Um, now I'm going to read scripture this morning. If you wouldn't mind standing with me in honor of reading God's word, um, and I'm going to read. From Hebrews chapter 4, just a few verses here. I'm going to read, actually just two verses. I'm going to read verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him of whom we must give an account. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day and for your many blessings. And we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house this morning, to hear your word proclaimed. We pray that uh, as Jason has prepared to, to bring your message this morning, we pray that you speak through him. We, we like hearing him speak and, and share the word, but we really want to hear from you this morning. We want you to be the voice that's leading, guiding, and directing us in all that we do, Lord. Um, Pray for this time where we can worship you and praise you for who you are and what you've done. And then, Lord, as we would leave later on um, this morning, that you would lay upon our heart those that we can reach out for the gospel. Lord, we as a church want to be a church that is about sharing your name, making you known, because we know without what you've done for us and what you did on the cross, we're lost and have no hope. But in you... We have, we have hope for all of eternity. Lord, we love you and praise you and thank you for all that you've given us. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. <clears throat> Pastor Dave is on vacation this week. This week is uh, fall break for ECS and uh, Evansville. Uh, EBSC, ECS, Warwick County. The schools are on fall break this week. There's a lot of families traveling, a lot of vacations going on. Uh, Pastor Dave is on vacation as well. Jackson is uh, on vacation uh, as well. So we want to encourage you guys to pray for our staff. We are thankful for the leadership we have here at First Southern. Pray for them in this week uh, off, that they would get rest, that they would enjoy time with their family. Pray for Pastor Dave. I think he is uh, babysitting through half of his vacation. He mentions that a lot. And uh, pray for him through that. Uh, that might not quite be a vacation for him, but uh, it will be a joy for him to be with his grandson. Uh, so pray for them. Uh, we are excited to meet together, uh, to, to look at God's word, to worship together. Uh, the words of that song, we come with open hearts, let the ancient word impart. We are here, and my prayer is that we are here together with open hearts to hear from God today. So let's pray as we continue in worship today that the Lord would move here today. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to meet together. We take it for granted. We are not guaranteed a facility to meet in. We're not guaranteed the freedom to meet. But we have that now. So let us show our thankfulness for that and our gratitude that you've blessed us in so many ways. And help us to take advantage of the opportunity that we have to worship today. To hear from you, we pray that you would speak to us. Father, we pray that you would be honored through this time. We pray that 
as a body of believers that meet together, that we would become more like Christ today, that we would be transformed by your word, that our hearts would be open to your truth and that your spirit would lead us through spiritual truth here today. I pray that you are honored through the songs that we sing. May the meditation of our hearts, may the words of our mouths be pleasing to you today through this time. And we pray that you're honored through that. Change our lives, change our hearts today in Jesus' name. Amen. wholeheartedly, just like Jason was talking about earlier.
All right, good morning. <clears throat> As always, it is an honor and privilege uh, to be able to share with you this morning, uh, to share from God's Word. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 11. Psalm 118 is somewhat the middle of the Bible, so if you want to try and find the middle of the side, flip it open and then kind of go from there. Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11. <clears throat> Pastor Dave finished Jonah last week, and I am preaching today, so I'm setting the tone for what we're going to do. We're going to go through Psalms next. That would, I'm just kidding. Psalms would take Pastor Dave like, I don't know. I, I don't know. <clears throat> we're going to be in Psalm 119. Uh, this is the longest chapter in the entire Bible. We're only going to look at a few verses here uh, today, but know that there is great beauty found in this chapter. I would encourage you to check out the entire chapter today, this week. Read through it. It's a psalm that highlights and praises the gift that we have in the Word of God, the treasure that is there, <clears throat> the resource that we have to hear, to study, to memorize, to meditate on, and to be transformed by. The last time I had the opportunity to preach, we looked at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, and it says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. The challenge there is to be transformed by the renewal of your mind, not just transformed in the moment of salvation, but daily in our relationship with God, renewing our minds through his word. He has given us his word so that we will, will so that it will be in us that we might trust in him more and more, and that our faith will display that. Our faith will display and will be a telltale sign of what degree we are connected to the word of God. So how is your trust today? How is your confidence in your faith today? How is your joy and your peace today? How is your assurance today? your strength, your endurance? Are you growing in your faith? What Christian doesn't want to grow in their faith, to be strengthened? We can do that by reading, memorizing, meditating on the Word of God. We have the tools and resources to grow. <clears throat> 2 Peter 1.3 says his divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Do we truly believe that the word of God has everything that we need that pertains to life and godliness, to live out our faith? Do we believe the Bible really is true and trustworthy, that it is perfect and eternal, and gives us everything that pertains to life and godliness. If we do believe that, how much of it do we know? How much of it have we exposed our lives to? How much have we taken in of the word of God? How much of it have we stored up in our hearts? <clears throat> it is budget season here at First Southern. We are looking at the budget for next year, looking at what that looks like. Let me ask you this question. If we were to add a line item, <clears throat> excuse me, to the budget for next year that said, we will give each of you $1,000 for every scripture verse you have memorized, how much would we have to increase the budget? I hope so. I hope that it would be a drastic change. But when I think about that, that brings some convictions. And it may bring conviction to you as well. 
that we might know the Bible says this or that, but how much have we committed to memory? How much have we stored in our heart? How much have we allowed God's word to be absorbed into our lives? Do we truly believe it has everything we need to live a godly life? This psalm celebrates the gift that we have of God's word that points us in that direction. The instruction and the perfect guide that is given to us as believers. And its goal is to enable us as God's people to see his goodness, to see him in his word and desire it so much that it does renew our minds daily. That it does transform every part of our lives. We just sang a song earlier One pure and holy passion. The words go like this. If you guys don't want me to sing it, I'm going to read it. Thanks, Joey. No, not happening. Give me one pure and holy passion. Give me one magnificent obsession. Give me one glorious ambition for my life to know and follow hard after you. To know and follow hard after you. To grow as your disciple in your truth. The world is empty, pale, and poor compared to knowing you, my Lord. Lead me on and I will run after you. As we read this passage today in Psalm 119, I hope that is our prayer. To embrace the word of God, to so strongly desire the word of God above everything else, to passionately pursue scripture, to hide it in our hearts, to live out God's word, to have a passion and an obsession an ambition to know God and his word more. I hope that is our prayer today. Psalm 119, 9 through 11 will be on the screen. This is from the English Standard Version. If you want to read there, follow along in your copy. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have again today. Father, we thank you for your word that you have given us everything that we need that pertains to life and godliness and it's sitting in front of us. Father, I pray that today we do something about that. That by the leading of your spirit, you would prompt us to seek you out, to seek out your word, to understand, to know your word, to meditate, to memorize, to study, to embrace it, to allow it to consume us so that our minds may be renewed on a daily basis. Help us today to hear from you. I pray that you give me words of boldness to proclaim the gospel. And Father, that we are changed by that today. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. The first point this morning, uh, there's uh, that outline is not on the back of your worship guide, but there's a big blank space, so you can write in any notes if you would like to. The first point today is the pursuit of godly purpose. This text in Psalm 119, 9 through 11, it begins with a question, one that I think is very relevant to our context of life today. How can a young man keep his way pure? And we may reword that question when we ask. We may look at it differently. We, we live in a corrupt, sinful world, right? We can all agree on that. We don't have to look very far to see the corruption and sin in our world. And the writer here is asking, in the midst of a crooked generation, in a sin-stained world, how can I keep my way pure? The world itself is not going to help with that. The world is not going to help us live a pure life, so how can we do this? And I think this question gets back to the most basic, basic but profound question in life of what is our purpose? In our existence, what is the point? What's the purpose. In the the Westminster Catechism, if you're not familiar with catechisms, it's uh, a resource, a tool of verbal question and answers. You have a question and answer uh, for memory purposes that you ask the question and then you answer the question. 
the very first question in this catechism is, what is the chief end of man? What is our purpose? What is the chief end of man? And the answer is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That in the context of all that God has revealed of himself through the scriptures, our purpose, our existence is to glorify him and to enjoy him forever. New City Catechism takes it to the next level with the question, how can we glorify God? We glorify God by enjoying him, loving him, trusting him, and by obeying his will, commands, and law. So as we look at this purpose for our existence to glorify God, to acknowledge his greatness, to respond in worship and praise, to display his character in this world, to value him above all else, there's a flip side to that that we could look at as well. If the ultimate goal of life is to glorify God and enjoy him forever, then the flip side of that could be said that the ultimate goal is to not sin. If we believe sinning is falling short of the glory of God, falling short of glorifying God by embracing other things in this world, then they can have a similar explanation. They can mean very similar things. If we can learn how to glorify God by enjoying him forever, we might not know or we might know how not to sin. And if we could learn how not to sin, we would know how to glorify God and to enjoy him. And the writer here asks, how can I keep my way pure? How can I live a life that is glorifying to God? How can I overcome the ruin of this sinful world? What can help me from giving in to all? what is all around me that I can look everywhere and see sin? What will enable me to live a holy life in the midst of this wicked world? How can we stay true to God? How can we live a pure life? And the psalmist knew the key to a pure life was a heart that was made clean by the word of God. The scriptures are the answer to how to live a holy life, how to pursue a godly purpose. And Paul knew this as well. He wrote in 2 Timothy, flee from youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. A pure heart leads to a pure life, but this is where we have to be absolutely clear. We are incapable of doing this on our own. In Jeremiah 17, he tells us the hard truth that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. I know I've said this from the pulpit before, but don't trust your heart. The world says follow your heart, trust your heart. Jeremiah says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. We need a new heart. We need a pure heart to pursue a godly purpose. You must have a new heart. So as we go through this passage that is going to call us to hide the word of God in our hearts and seek after God, we need to be sure of our own salvation first. This pursuit is for believers who have been changed by God. None of this can happen except through a relationship with God through Christ. Only through Christ can we bear fruit. Can we glorify God and enjoy him? We must be connected to Christ. We must be connected to the vine, as John 15 says. That apart from Christ, we can do nothing. We have to be connected to Christ and his power in us to live a lifelong, obedient life. So if you're here and you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, let me tell you that he created you with a purpose with a plan before the foundations of this world for your life, for your existence. In that purpose, he created you to glorify him and enjoy him forever by having a personal relationship with him. He created you to be with him in perfect peace, in perfect harmony. Adam and Eve experienced that in the garden. But then they disobeyed God 
and sin entered the world and it changed everything. The bad news is that sin corrupted all of humanity, all of creation, and it affects us. It affects you and me sitting here in Evansville, Indiana. Romans 3.23 says, For all have, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all sinners born into this world. It is in our nature. It is in our being. And that sin separates us from a just and holy God. We fall short of God's perfect standard, which makes it more difficult knowing that we can't do anything about that, that there's nothing in our own power that can overcome that. We can't earn our way back to God through good deeds, through coming to church, through memorizing scripture, through doing any of the things that we're going to talk about today. We cannot overcome that sin that separates us from God. But the good news of the gospel is that even in your sins, God still loves you, even as a sinner. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So knowing our sin, God chose to love you still. And that was at the expense of Christ, his son. Paying the price for our sins, Christ left heaven, came to this earth, lived a perfect, sinless life, and then was beaten, spit upon, and murdered on a cross to pay for the price of our sins. There was a price that needed to be paid that only Jesus could pay as the perfect sacrifice. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. There was a price that needed to be paid. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Our sins separated us from God. Every single one of us born into this world, sinners, spiritually dead. But God offers us new life, a new heart. Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your mouth that you believe and are justified, and it is with your... <clears throat> For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Confessing Jesus as Lord recognizes his ultimate authority over all things, including your life and your existence. We confess our sin, our failure to live up to God's standard, and we repent of that life that we have lived. We change the direction and the orientation of our life to pursue a godly purpose. If we believe in Jesus, that means we trust him for eternal life. We trust him with everything, with our entire life. Romans 10, 13 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's no qualification. Nothing you do but call on the name of the Lord for forgiveness and salvation. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. If you put your faith in Christ alone, this means you will be with God forever. You will fulfill the purpose and plan that he created you with for your life, for your existence, that he has always desired. <clears throat> if that's you today and you've never trusted in Christ, you don't have a relationship with God, my prayer is that you understand the gospel and God changes your heart and gives you a new heart today. When we come to faith in Christ, our lives change. Pastor and missionary Avery Willis shares this reality of that though. Receiving Christ does not guarantee that you will not struggle with issues in life. It does not mean that you will not be tempted to give your devotion to someone or something else. It does not mean that you will not shy away from the costs of discipleship and becoming more like Christ. It means that he forgives you, that he has a lasting relationship with you that extends into eternity, that he will grant you strength, power, and wisdom as you seek to be his disciple. This is the truth of the gospel. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to anyone who believes. 
If you've put your faith in Christ, you have hope and purpose. You have a pursuit to godly purpose. To ask the question, the follow-up, how can I keep my way pure? How can I honor God with my life? As the psalmist writes here. Only the word of God can direct us to that. When we become a Christian, you begin to live a life for God. And you can expect that life to look different. God wants to change you. He wants your life to change as you follow Jesus, even if that means sacrifice. The goal is for believers to look less and less like the unsaved world and more and more like Jesus. That change only happens when God brings it about. He will transform your life, making you more like Christ. And he gives us everything that we need that pertains to, li to, <clears throat> to life and godliness. And our relationship with that truth, with the word of God, will determine whether we pursue godly purpose, which takes us to our second point, a wholehearted commitment. If we've put our faith in Christ and understand our purpose in this life, there is a response, a call to action in our lives that takes a wholehearted commitment. Psalm 119, 9 and 10, how can a young man keep his way pure? How can we live out this purpose? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you, let me not wander from your commandments. How do we do this? We guard our lives according to God's word. We filter our lives, our decisions, our aspirations, our ambitions through the filter of what God's word says. We seek him with our whole hearts. We stay close to his word and his commands. It requires action. It requires a response. It requires discipline. And this is more than just knowing things. This is more than just a head knowledge. That's why it says, with my whole heart. It's more than just knowing something is important. Yes, the church is meeting today and saying, read your Bible. If we didn't say that, what would we be doing? It's more than that, though. It's more than that. It's more than a group of Christians getting together on a Sunday morning and agreeing that the word of God is important and that we should read it, that we, we probably should memorize it, we probably should meditate on it, we probably should talk about it. It's more than just coming to those conclusions and being done. Let me illustrate this two ways. <clears throat> a pastor that I, I like to read from, Tony Morita, had this illustration. He said, called my kids into the living room, and I said, hey guys, go clean your room. 30 minutes later, he goes into their room. Nothing has been done. But the kids come running out, and they say, dad, dad. We memorized what you said to go clean our room. We actually looked it up and we know how to say go clean your room in Greek. We're actually starting a small group on what dad meant by cleaning your room. And he said, no, you did nothing. You were supposed to actually do it. Is that how we come to the word of God and know what we're supposed to do? But we do all of these other things instead? You see, knowledge that does not lead to action does not serve a purpose. But sometimes I think we don't even necessarily seek that deeper knowledge of these things. And this is going to be a time of confession for me, I guess. When I was in high school, <clears throat> I graduated in the top 10 of my class. I had a 3.9 GPA. I did really well. And <clears throat> embarrassingly, I retained so little. But I finished at the top of the class, 3.9 GPA. I took four years of French through middle school and high school. Four years of French, and I can ask you, do you speak French? And I purposely learned how to say, I don't know, in French. So if my French teacher is watching somehow through Facebook, I'm sorry I've disappointed you. But I spent a lot of time in those things, and I have nothing that 
I, not nothing, but very little that I've retained that I uh, can stand on. Another confession is I am navigationally challenged. Geography and navigation, we don't mix. Luckily, I don't believe in luck, but that's the word that came out of my mouth. Samantha loves and is pretty good with navigation and geography. So we work well together. But we just took a trip to Gulf Shores a couple weeks ago. And you know what we did? We plugged it into the GPS. I put an address in the GPS, and we made it to Gulf Shores, Alabama. I can't tell you what interstate we were on. I can't tell you what cities we passed through. I can't tell you any of that things, but you know what? We got there, and we got back. Is that how we approach the Word of God? Is it the same with the Word of God? We know it's important. We know it's powerful. We know we should read it. We know all of these things, but are we doing them? The Bible has never been more accessible to humans than it is today. What are we doing with that? There are tools and resources available to help us with reading the Bible, with all sorts of scripture intake and memorization. But with that blessing of it being so accessible, have we retreated even further from wanting to know more because it is so accessible? Because if somebody asks me about the Bible, I know it's one click away, or I say, hey, Google, and I can find the answer. Have we retreated to that instead of knowing the word of God to actually studying it and taking it in? Has our desire for growth diminished? Do we have a hunger and a thirst for the word of God? And don't hear me say that reading and memorizing scripture is the end goal. The goal is not to see how many Bible verses you can memorize, but the goal is godliness. To live a life that is glorifying to God. To hide God's word in our hearts so that we can live out his truth. The goal is to memorize the word of God so it can transform our mind, transform our lives. The word of God provides practical guidelines for a well-lived life that honors God. We should pursue that wholeheartedly. There's a link between the pursuit of God's word and God himself. That's why it says, I seek you with my whole heart. We are learning the character, the value of God in his word. God is calling us to himself to be the person he has created us to be. And it's not impossible to live wholly devoted to Christ. And a lot of that comes down to our attitude towards sin. The psalmist asks, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. And if you jump down to verse 11, I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. How do we view sin? This comes down to our theological view of sin in Christ, that in Christ Jesus, we are made sinless. We have put our faith in Christ. We have been made sinless. We won't experience that until we are in the presence of God in heaven, but there is an expectation on us now on this earth to sin less, that we should be pursuing a life where we sin less. Are we working toward that? With what effort are we working towards that? Matthew 22, 37 through 40, a familiar passage. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Psalm 119, with my whole heart I seek you. Wholehearted commitment to God. This is crucial to living a holy and pure life. It focuses on our inner being, our heart, the real you on the inside, the real you in me that needs to be transformed by the truth of God's word. That's what we seek is transformation. Proverbs 6, verses 20 through 23 instructs us, ex instructs us on how crucial it is to have the word of God in front of us. Bind them on your hearts always. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, they will lead you. 
When you lie down, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk with you. For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light. And the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. That the word of God leads our entire lives. The discipline of scripture intake is vital to the Christian life. When the word of God is taken in and rightly practiced, there is an increase in knowledge of who God is. And then that leads to a closer conformity to Christ, us becoming more like Christ. If the word of God dwells richly in us, we will have wise counsel wherever we go. Whatever we do, it will lead us. Back to verse 9, how can a young man keep his way pure by guarding it according to your word? The first action here is defensive. We guard our lives by the word of God. We keep God's word. And the word of God guards us. It protects us and keeps us from impurity in both our thoughts and our actions. As we guard our life by the word of God, the word of God guards our lives. There's no better illustration of this than Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 where he's tempted in the wilderness. Three times Satan tempts Jesus and he responds with the word of God. As it is written was his response. He was prepared for the temptation in weakness and loneliness in the wilderness. His response was with scripture and he sets that perfect example for us to follow. And we too can guard our lives by the power of of God's word. In Ephesians 6, it calls God's word the sword of the spirit. This is our weapon to fight off temptation and sin in our lives. There's a scripture memory resource I would encourage you to check out called Fighter Verses. Uh, it's a Desiring God John Piper resource. It's a collection of memory verses and a, a whole curriculum that goes through how to memorize scripture, how to hide God's word in your heart how to fight and it calls it a fight because we are in a battle that the word of God the sword of the spirit is the weapon to fight off temptation and sin in our lives and we need to be ready for that fight because we cannot overcome sin and Satan without the presence of God's word without the power of God's word church are we ready to fight are we willing to fight are we prepared to fight? Is our arsenal full of swords to fight any occasion? When it says the sword of the spirit, I, I always had this idea that the word of God as a whole is the sword of the spirit. One, one sword that fights all things. And we went through a study with our college students where Dr. Jeremiah talked about this, that it's an arsenal of swords that fight different circumstances. If you have the whole Bible memorized, that's fantastic, and you do have the sword of the Spirit complete. But there's an arsenal of swords that we can have to fight every circumstance in our lives. Is your arsenal full of Scripture? I like the way one commentary put it. Imagine yourself in the midst of a big decision and needing guidance, or struggling with a difficult temptation, and needing victory. The Holy Spirit enters your arsenal and looks around for available weapons, but all he finds is a John 3.16, a Genesis 1.1, and the Great Commission. Those are great swords to have, but they're not made for every battle. Are we prepared how do we go about filling our heart with the word of God, filling our arsenal with the supply of swords to be used at every turn of life? If we read through all of this psalm here in 119, there are very few verses that don't allude to the word of God, to scripture. The psalm calls these instructions true, sure, worthy of trust, hope, and faith. The scriptures guide the faithful in the way that they live, and we must turn to the word of God. If we want to fulfill our purpose, if we want to keep our way pure, if we want to guard our lives, we must discipline ourselves with a consistent, wholehearted devotion to consuming the word of God. Read it, know it, memorize it. Let the knowledge of God become the wisdom of God that fights those battles and leads us to godliness in our lives. 
We guard our ways by having God's word in our life with diligent passion and sincerity, and we must seek it with a whole heart. The second part of verse 10, it says, let me not wonder from your commandments. And the writer kind of sneaks in this prayer, this request to God, let me not wander from your commands. There's a lot of wisdom to just that verse in the midst of this, that he knew he needed help. He knows that it's easier to make a promise to God to tell God I'm going to do something compared to actually going through with it and actually doing it. He says, with my whole heart, I seek you. And I know that we read statements like that with skepticism because we know how difficult that is. When someone says, give everything to God, we have skepticism because of how difficult that is. And we don't see examples of that. But he follows up with this request. Let me not wonder from your commandments. There's two things I think we need to note, that there's a sense that he knows the commands and he's trying to guard his life according to them, but also that he is desperately in need of help to stay close to those commands, to abide in God's word and not to wander. He seeks the Lord with his whole heart, but recognizes that he needs God's help to succeed. Charles Spurgeon puts it this way, the man of God exerts himself but does not trust himself. He knows that even his whole strength is not enough to keep him right unless the king is his keeper and he who made the commands shall make him constant in obeying them. We should seek the Lord wholeheartedly and humble ourselves to know that we need him to succeed. This reminds me of a 300-year-old hymn Come thou fount. Again, I'm not going to sing it. But the words say this. Let our, our, it says, oh, oh to grace how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wondering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. It's not a doubt of the love that we have for God, but an acknowledgement that we are prone to leave. We are prone to wonder. We need help staying close to God. And the prayer of that last verse, here's my heart, take and seal it. Giving it to the Lord in pursuit. Seeking him wholeheartedly by Asking him to help and to lead. Take my heart, Lord, as I seek you with all that I am. Asking, help me not wander from your commandments. Let me guard my life according to those commands. This brings us to the final point, number three, the treasure of God's word. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to to your word. With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Verse 11, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So as we look at verse 11 here, I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. This is a a popular verse. It's a verse that's been used in VBS and children's curriculum and children's ministry and memorization. And it's a good verse, but it pertains to every believer, not just kids. It holds a good amount of weight and is something we should look at. It would be naive to not connect the dots of the value of scripture memorization that comes from this verse. This verse teaches that those who have treasured God's word in their hearts will not live a life characterized or dominated by sin. This is returning to the pursuit of a, a godly purpose to glorify God and not sin. And the word of God being the difference maker in that. D.L. Moody once said, this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. Which way are we going? Is the power of the word of God as underrated in the church as it seems? 
do we see and understand and experience the transformation that is possible from what we hold in our hands, what you have on your phone. We have what we need to succeed in the ultimate goal of life, everything that pertains to life and godliness. The teaching in this verse is that one way to keep from sinning, one way to attain the ultimate reason for being to glorify God and enjoy him forever is to store up the word of God in our hearts as something very precious, as silver or gold. And that, the word, will function to keep us from sin. Hiding God's word in our heart is a deterrent to sin. And you'd think that would be enough motivation for us to dive into God's word and spend time in it, meditating on it, memorizing it. But we struggle. And we value other things over our relationship with God and God's word itself. And that's a tough reality. Last week when when Pastor Dave concluded Jonah, he referenced the New Testament when Jesus asked, Do you love me? Go feed my sheep. Do you love me? Do we love the word of God? Read it. Do we love the word of God? Memorize it. Do we love the word of God? Meditate on it. We have to realize that there are things that are fighting for our attention and devotion and they are winning too often because we're letting them into our hearts and our minds are we allowing the word of god to infiltrate our lives the same way we're allowing social media and politics and movies and entertainment to flow in our lives and in our mind do we treasure these things more than the word of god are we willing to admit it that they might be Are we willing to turn from that and pursue God's word as a treasure that is greater than anything this world can offer? The writer here says, I've stored up your word. In other translations, it may say, I have hidden or I have treasured. The Hebrew word that's used here is used more than 30 times in the Old Testament, and it always means to hide or to store. So the idea of it being treasure comes from the idea that What is worth hiding? What is worth storing up? A treasure that you value. So the writer says, I have stored up your word. I have hidden your word because it is valuable. Because its value is like a treasure. Do we value the word of God? Have we experienced the value and treasure of God's word that leads to salvation, that leads to God's provision in our lives? It's not just about memorizing or having the word stored. It's it's not just about valuing the word of God. It's both. It's about memorizing and having it stored because it is valuable. We value the word of God and therefore store it in our hearts. Theologian Sam Storms puts it this way. God is most glorified in us when our knowledge and experience of him ignite a forest fire of joy that consumes all competing pleasures and he alone becomes the treasure that we prize. Think of a fire just destroying everything else in our lives that we treasure and leaving only the word of God to dwell on. We want to fulfill our purpose of existing to glorify God and enjoy him forever. We want to do that. We need to stop looking for guidance and direction and joy from every other source that cannot provide that. If we truly desire to live a godly life, we must commit ourselves wholeheartedly to the word of God and store it up like a treasure in our hearts. When scripture is stored in our hearts, it's available for the Holy Spirit to use when it's needed most. Memorizing scripture strengthens our faith because it reinforces the truths of God at the right time. A scriptural truth that is brought to your mind by the Holy Spirit at just the right moment can be a weapon that makes a difference in your spiritual journey and the battle that you are in. And this is a discipline that takes work. Like all good disciplines, you have to put the time in. 
but the results are more beneficial than we could ever imagine. Internalizing the word of God is our best weapon to defend against the onslaught of sin in this world and in our lives and in our families. Memorizing God's word in your, memorize God's word in your head. Meditate on it in your heart. Meditate on the word until it is in your heart. With God's word in your heart, you can face any circumstance. So today, maybe it's the life circumstance you are currently in, that you're facing sickness, or you're facing a drastic life-changing decision, you're facing retirement, leaving home to go to school, moving out on your own, getting married, maybe facing discouragement, or suffering physically, or mentally, or emotionally, or you need encouragement just knowing that God hears your prayers, or encouragement that his grace is sufficient regardless of that circumstance. Or encouragement to know that he will provide for you even when you can't see it. Or simply to know that he's still in control. Or whether it's while you're at home with your family. Or standing in line <clears throat> at the grocery store. Taking a walk. Driving your car. Cleaning the house. Mowing the lawn. Sitting in a classroom. Clocking in for work. Rocking a baby. Sleeping. Eating. You can benefit from the spiritual discipline of scripture memorization and meditation if you have God's word in your life, in your mind, in your heart. To get more personal, maybe when you're sitting in front of your computer screen or on your phone and you're about to look at something you know you should not be looking at. <clears throat> Do you need that reminder of 1 Corinthians 10.13? That God will provide an escape. That there's no temptation that has overtaken man. That there will be a way out. Or maybe you're in the midst of a trial and life is tough and you need the reminder of James to count it all joy because your faith is growing and you will persevere. Or maybe <clears throat> when your child can't sleep at night because they're having nightmares and you need to sit and pray with them. And remind them of Psalm 56, 3, that when I am afraid, I will trust in God. These verses are there for us when we need them. And they're just sitting here, and we're not trying to engage. Maybe it's when you're at work and you're, the gossip train's coming by, and you need the reminder of Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, only that which is good for building up, that it may give grace to those who hear. The resource is here. The weapons are here to fight with. Ricky read that the, the word of God is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. Our, our students are memorizing 2 Timothy 3, that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent and complete, equipped with every good word. It's a process, you see? I'm standing before you saying, I'm working on this as well. It's a process. But it takes work. But knowing that the word of God is God's word that he breathed out, and that it is always profitable, that way we may be equipped for every good work, are we pursuing this? You may say, I'm not good at memorizing Scripture, I have a bad memory, that's usually the, the common excuse. That's not an excuse. Guys, I'm sorry, that's just, it's not an excuse. We have so many things memorized. Songs, how many passwords do you have that you have memorized? Most of you write them down probably. Song lyrics, phone numbers, whatever it may be. We have things memorized whether we realize it or not. We have many things memorized that are trivial if not just simply a waste. If you knew the amount of 90s wrestling trivia I have in my mind right now, you would be embarrassed for me. We can memorize. A bad memory is not an excuse. God used common, uneducated men to change the world. To write his word on their hearts, to share it with others. I think he can use us as well. 
I'm telling you there's a chance. God can use us, each of us. We, has to, we have to ask if we desire to know the word of God. If I took that same $1,000 offer I mentioned earlier, that's not real. If you thought it was real, just to clarify, you can talk to Betty when she's back from vacation. It's not real. But if I took that same $1,000 offer as earlier and changed it and said I would pay you $1,000 for every verse you memorize between now and next Sunday, how many would you do? <laughs> the honesty right there. Do we value that? Is that the motivation we need? What is our motivation to know the word of God? Psalm 19, verses 10 through 11. God says this about his word. They are more desirable than gold. Yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. More desirable than gold. The real value of the word is far greater than a thousand dollars a verse. But the question is this, do we believe it? Believing this will be the crucial motivation that we need. That there is great reward. I want to end with a challenge to pursue the discipline of scripture memory. We need practical ways to do that and there are resources and the church wants to be that resource to work together and understand the power of scripture but i want to challenge each of you today to start today somewhere i want you to write down an area of your life where you need encouragement or you need to grow in and find scripture that will help encourage that, that you can memorize and meditate on. If you need help with that, see a staff member, see a Bible study teacher, see one of our deacons and ask for suggestions. Start with Psalm 119, 9 through 11. This is a great passage to just start with and recognize the power of God's word, the treasure of his word. We're going to have a time of invitation in just a minute. I ask you guys to join me in prayer as we ask God how we should respond to his word. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for today. You've blessed us in so many ways that we, we can't even count. Father, you have created us with <clears throat> a purpose purpose that was there before the foundation of the world, the purpose that is surrounded by your love, your plan in Christ Jesus for our lives, a plan that was not surprised by sin, but ultimately had exactly what we need to overcome that, the sacrifice of Christ. So I pray that anyone here that doesn't know that they are in Christ, that they would have a burden on their heart from your spirit to lead them to the truth of the gospel, that it is the power of salvation to anyone who would believe. And I pray that you would save them today. And I pray for Christians today that as we meet together, I pray that we understand that we're commanded to meet together and we understand the importance of that to encourage each other, to build one another up, to stir up one another, to love and good works. Father, we need help in doing all of that. Humble us so that we can come to you in desperation of knowing that we need help being the church. We need help in our personal journey of becoming more like Christ, and we pray that you would help us. Father, help us to treasure your word, to know how good it is, to taste and see how good it is, and then to have that hunger and thirst that just draws us back to it. Help us to encourage each other to do that together, to point each other, to share experiences, to be able to share burdens, to confess that we don't know what we're doing, but we know that you do and that you give us guidance and direction through your word. So help us to fall on our knees and know your goodness and run to you. 
pray that we would respond in whatever way you call us to individually, that you want our entire lives. Help us to surrender those things to you. We pray that you're honored through that response. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.